I'm going to come on somebody. Are y'all excited about what the Lord's doing? You know, I just want to thank Pastor Sullivan. I want to thank this church and all, all the leaders. You know, I've heard about this church, how it's been growing, and this building is beautiful, and, and God's doing something. God wouldn't have you build this big building for no reason. Amen. Well, well, well let's just get to it. I'll tell you a scripture that the Lord has just been burning in my heart for, for a few months. And, and this is not the, the message. This is just where we're going. I'm just honored to be here with you today. And as your pastor said, there's a reason that, that I'm here today. And there's a reason that your church has been experiencing. And this is a reason that the youth just got back for camp. Because when kids come back from a good camp, they're a little crazy. But the thing about it is, check this out. In Ephesians 3 and 19 and 20, this is not the message. This is just, we're going to lay the foundation for the day. This is not a Sunday morning weekend. This is a, a, a complete day. And some of you might get to go eat lunch, but we might just stay here all day. You have no idea what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Because Ephesians 3 and 19 says this. It says, to know the love of Christ, which passes mere knowledge. Now, what does your knowledge tell you about today? I'm going to come to church. We're going to leave at 12.03 like usual. We're going to go down to Handy John's Diner or wherever, and we're going to have lunch, and then we're going to come back at 5.04, and we're going to have service tonight. We're going to be done at 6.30, and we're going to go home, right? Was that what the Holy Spirit said for today, or is that what we usually do? Is this our mindset? And it goes on to say, we'll start over in Ephesians 3, 19 and 20, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Is there anybody in here that is completely filled with the fullness of God? I'm talking the fullness of God. I'm talking the complete fullness of God. That everywhere that you walk, you don't have to wear your shirt that says, I'm a Christian. But the thing is, people know that when you walk by and your shadow walks by, that people are healed. The fullness of God. You know, when Peter walked by somebody, the, okay, I guess we're going to start the service. When Peter walked by and they said that his shadow healed the sick, you know, from the translation from the Greek to the English, there was no correct terminology for this. It wasn't his shadow that healed the sick. What happened is if you studied out, there was so much of God inside of him that when he walked around, he was not a thermometer. He was a thermostat. He changed the very climate in a room because of how much of God that he had in his life. Well, well how was that? How do you get so much power in your life? I'm glad you asked because in Matthew 6 and 6, it says this but you when you pray go into your room and when you have shut your door it doesn't say this is the bible but also means turn your cell phone off and it says when you go into your room shut your door and pray to the father in the secret place when is the last time that you went into a secret place turn your phone off and got by yourself for more than 15 20 30 minutes an hour two hours and just said god i just want you See, most of the times we go to God with a prayer request, say, oh, God, I need help in my marriage. Oh, God, I need help with this and I need help with that. But the whole time God is saying this, hey, hey, can I talk for a minute? Hey, please give me one moment. I just want to talk to you because that coworker that you're always just spitting just junk about it and you're so mad and you're so frustrated, the only reason I gave you that job was so that you could win them to me. But every time you come to prayer, you just talk about yourself all the time. Can, can we talk about, about what I need for a minute? Because, see, the Bible says this, the kingdom of God is within us, and he's just wanting to get it out of us. And he's wanting to give you. See, a lot of times you've been praying for that good job that you've got that you're providing for your family, you know, and your wife drives an Escalade and all that. That's great. I'm glad for you. But the reason God gave you that job was that you could be a missionary to that job because you may be the only Christian that somebody sees. I've got a friend of mine who is basically the pastor at an army depot. He said, he said, Joe, every time I get a break, I go sit on a picnic table. And people just come sit down by me because I'm the only pastor they have because they won't walk into a church. So we've got to go win the world. We can't invite people always to the church, but we've got to go out and win the, the people to the Lord. Amen. So in Ephesians 3.19, now we're going to get to 20. It says, now to him. Who's excited? Fifteen of us. Well, it's going to get good here in a minute. And it goes on to say, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, Woo! Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that's in us. How much power do you have in you? Well, let me explain it to you. How much have you read? The Word says in Psalms 119, 9, 11, it says, How can a young person cleanse his way by taking heed according to the Word? I've hid the Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How much Word do you have in you? How much time have you gone in Matthew 6 and 6 this week and spent the time with the Lord that you walked into your secret place, shut your door, so when you go to work, when you go to your family reunion, that you will be able to speak life into somebody, that somebody will see how much life that you have into them. Everybody has hobbies. Everybody has things they like to do. Do you know what we like to do? We like to fast and pray. When you fast, you save tons of money, and when you pray, you hear God. 
when you save money and you hear God, you can give more to missions. We're an Assembly of God church, right? That's what we like to do. We like to give money to missions. But so, so here we get into the Word now. That was just kind of the opening of what I felt that God had on my heart. See, in Texture Canada, my wife and I have a ministry called Burn Texture Canada. This is what we do. And also, well, it's, we do a lot of things. My wife and I were the young adult pastors at First Assembly of God. We also are the staff evangelists. We also have a ministry called Burn Texture Canada. The first Friday of every month, we have a revival service. They're wild. And then what we do on Monday nights is we have prayer. On Tuesday nights, we have prayer. On Wednesday before a young adult service, we have prayer. And on Thursday night, just for fun, we have prayer. And Sunday before service, we have prayer. You know what we do for fun? We pray. Because when you, we're like little kids. The Bible says that we're supposed to come like little kids. You know, my little son, my three kids are named this, Malachi, Judah, and Ezra. Their names all have special meanings. Little Ezra, he's my man. He's two years old, and he just comes running into the house and runs up to me every day. This little man can see me 15, 20 times a day. Every time he sees me, he yells, D! And comes running up to me, and I grab him in my arms. We're the same way with God. We may spend, you know, five minutes with the Lord here and 10 minutes here and 30 minutes here, but every time we get into his presence, I run into him, and I say, Jesus, it's so glad to be with you. And some people say, that's crazy. Spend a lot of time with them. You will just want to spend your waking hours with him. You will get up early in the morning. See, one time I was sitting at an Assembly of God church at 6 in the morning, and I said, God, I need a scripture that I can build my life on. Give me that. You know how, like, some couples, they're like, we got our song. Well, with Jesus, I said, I want my scripture. And I felt the Lord say, Mark 1 and 35. And I'm like, great, can you tell me what it says? Because I'm sitting in the pitch black dark right now in the church. And he didn't answer me again, so I got up, turned the light on, and it said Jesus got up early in the morning and went to a solitary place where he prayed. You know what that means? That he got up and left everybody. He left the disciples because he knew that there was 12 people, then there were 70, and then there were multitudes that were coming to him to see what the Father was saying. So before he even got up in the morning, the best part of waking up is not Folgers in your cup, is hearing Jesus Christ speak to your heart. So what he did is he got alone with, with, with the Lord, and the disciples came looking for him and said, Jesus, you know, people are looking for you. And he said, you know, you know where I was going to be. I was going to be praying. And then he said, now I'm prepared. Now let's go into the next town and let's minister the gospel. And so they went into the next town. Man, when you get excited about Jesus, things start happening. Churches start growing. Crackheads get saved. Prostitutes come to know the Lord. When you just walk through Walmart, see, this is how the Lord does things. My son never runs out of diapers unless it's past midnight. Don't ask me why. That's just how things work. So every time you go to Walmart past midnight, do you know why you go at midnight? Because that's where the most people are ashamed to be around anybody in public go. If you don't believe me, what about the woman at the well? She didn't go to the well the same time that everybody else went to the well. She went to the well when nobody did. Why? Because she'd had so many husbands. And she went to the well when she thought she would see nobody. That's when the disciples said, said Christ, we're hungry. And he said, you go eat because there's, there's, there's things that you don't even know about. I'm going to go spend some time with one person. I'm going out of my way. I'm so full of the fullness of God that I'm going to somebody and I'm going to share life with them. Her life was converted. Did you know the worst woman in that city she had the worst reputation in that city. Went out and went and talked to people after she had, Jesus had ministered to her. Did you know this? This is crazy. The city went into a revival, a two-day revival after that because they saw that her life had changed. How could, how could they tell her life had changed? Because her countenance had changed. Have you ever seen somebody that has just been with Jesus? When they've just been with Jesus, their life changes. You can go into a prayer meeting, and when, whenever you, you, you walk, go into a room, you look one way. But ever you walk out of the room, you look one way. We have young people that have a hard day in, in life or at work, and they walk into a prayer meeting like this. About 30 minutes later, they're kind of jumping. An hour later, they're shouting. And two hours later, they leave. And I get reports. They go to McDonald's, IHOP, wherever else they're going. And they win people to the Lord. Everywhere they go. Because when you spend time with him, you're going to act like him. Have you ever been around somebody and you just started picking up on their lingo, the way that they talk, the way that they think? Because when you spend time with the Lord, that's how you're going you're to be. Amen? So the woman at the well, whenever she went back to the city, everybody was like, you've changed. You've changed what happened. And she tells them about Jesus. It wasn't Pastor Sullivan who went and started a revival. It was the woman with the worst reputation. 
There's people out there in your region, in your city, that you need to bring them in the house of the Lord because the Bible says in Psalms 97.5 that the mountains will melt like wax in the presence of God. And see, some people in life, they, they keep walking around the same mountain. They keep walking around the same mountain. They keep walking around the same mountain all their life. They're frustrated. But all of a sudden, that mountain will melt like wax in the presence of God, and they can walk right over it. They can conquer that through Jesus, all right? All right, let's pray. Let's get into the word. Father God, I want to thank you for this word. I want to thank you for this divine appointment, Lord. I'm just believing in my spirit that this morning and tonight, God is a kairos moment. Translated means a God moment in time. And Lord, I just pray that your will will be done with this church and each individual that is here, Lord. God, I humble myself before you and say your will be done. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, I'm going to tell you some things that I learned in, in elementary school, high school, and in seminary. I'm going to give you... Uh, a real quick program that can double your church in one week. I titled this message, Church Growth. Why in the world would this church build a sanctuary so much bigger than it is for church growth? I'm going to give you a systematic way to grow this church. Are you ready? Everybody bring one person next week. And everybody says, ha, oh, that's real funny. Great. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? When's the last time that somebody came up to you and said, oh, that God that you serve must be so real because I can see the way that you live your life. I just want to go to church with you. Where do you go to church? What's different about y'all? I just want to, I mean, I see at work, I see at high school, I see at junior high how people act. They may treat you and you just smile all the time because when you're full of him, see, Leonard Ravenhill says this, if you please God, it doesn't matter who you displease, but if you displease God, it doesn't matter who you please. And people can see, the Bible says that we are peculiar people. That we're to be different. Church growth, bring one person. And what happens if that person brings somebody else? See, the thing is, when some people get saved and radically changed, they bring a lot of people after that. Why? Because people saw how they used to be, and when they met the man Jesus, then they act differently, right? Come on, we're going to have a good time today. I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about two men that passed away in 1758. God bless their soul. One was named Jonathan Edwards. And they did a study on Jonathan Edwards from 1758 to 1906. This was what his descendants did, his legacy from 1758 to 1906. His legacy was this. Out of his descendants, there was 14 college presidents in his family, 100 college professors, 60 doctors, 100 lawyers, 30 judges, 3 senators, 1 vice president, 100 pastors, and 60 authors. That's pretty impressive that what one man, the legacy that he left for 150 years. Now, this other gentleman we're going to talk about is Matt Jutes. Now, back then, $12 million was a lot of money, okay? To our government today, it's not. So, $12 million. He cost the state of New York $12 million. 300 of the people from his family were living in complete poverty. 150 recorded criminals, 100 recorded drunks, 7 murderers, and half the females were prostitutes because of what one man and the way that he lived his life. See, our job is to go out and get the Matt Jutes and make them the Jonathan Edwards. That's what we're supposed to do. See, the Bible says this, Galatians 5 and 16, we, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. The Bible says that the flesh lusts against the Spirit. It doesn't say the Spirit lusts against the flesh. We're spiritual beings. And it goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, and this is where it's about to get good. It says, But it is written, I has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor entered to the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And when I read Ephesians 3 and 19 and 20 earlier, I want you to think about the fullness of God. And if this church is walking in the complete fullness of God, what could happen? See, I've got a friend that he, he's a runner and he likes to jog and run these little half marathons and all that. I don't know why you run if people aren't chasing you. But he likes to run and he's in shape and people are getting in shape and ready to run. And one day he said, I can't run. I said, well, why can't you run? He said, because see right here, I tweaked a little muscle right there. And I said, you what? He said, I tweaked a little muscle right there. I said, out of your whole entire body, you've got one little tweaked muscle and you can't run? So that's how the body of Christ is. The Bible says that we're a body fit together you might be one little you might just be like just one little part of the body and if you're not operating what all that God has for you in the fullness of God you're holding the body back you need to step up and be what God has called you to be because you can have the the best 
physical body, but if you've got one or two things out of place, you need to go to a chiropractor. Your life is messed up. Sometimes I wake up, my neck will be out of place like this. Everything else is working good, but my neck's out of place. And I'm just like, baby, just get me to the chiropractor. Get me to the chiropractor. You know, because you need to be put back in line. And there's some people today that if you will allow God to this morning and tonight, God can do an amazing work in you. Amen? I heard a story about a church in Oklahoma one time. There was a church, and they, they wanted church growth. And, and they did everything they could and tried to get people to come to church. And they just did all these things. And it was, they tried every gimmick you could do to get people to church. It just really didn't work. So the pastor had it so in his heart to build after years and years and years and years and years of doing this to build a new building. Well, one night, he, 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 here's what happened. The town started growing away from the church. So he built a church wherever the church, the city was growing. So what happened one day is this old building they had, kind of in the bad part of town now, caught on fire. And when the building caught on fire, they say the reports were that everybody came out to watch this church. The police department, the fire department, the news reporters, the, the TV cameras, and everybody came, and the church was on fire. And one little old lady walked up to the pastor and said, Pastor, if the church would have been on fire when we were over there, they would have all came. But it took a physical fire. So now let's go back to our new building that you built, and they're not coming. When the church gets on fire and they care about one thing, the power and the presence of God. See, whenever, whenever there's a fire, you don't have to advertise a fire. People will leave and talk about a fire of God. Whenever the fire of God is rolling, whenever, hey, how was church? I mean, it's pretty good today. I mean, this one, this one chick got up and walked out of a wheelchair. It was pretty cool. There's these, these, these two couples that are about to get a divorce. The power of God hit them. They got restored. And just, you know, it's just all these things start happening, reports of this. People are like, well, I want to see that in our church. So, so you mean the Bible's real? The book of Acts is real? That people are getting healed, saved? How many people got saved? Well, we're down this week. We only had six people get saved today. It was kind of a down number that, than usual. When people start, when this stuff starts happening, you're going to see growth. You're going to see supernatural things happen. I remember one time we were in one of our burn services, and we were about five minutes into the altar call, and the Lord said, stop everything. So I walked up there and I said, stop everything. All right, God, this is where you give me something else, you know. I was sitting there and I felt the Lord say, tell everybody that wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the evidence speaking in tongues, but before they get their hands lifted, they'll be filled. And so I said that, and all of a sudden people started to get their hands up and you heard like a roar across. And all of a sudden this one lady walks up to me after and she says, you know, Joe, I'm 36 years old. I've been in an assembly of God church my life and I've never spoken in tongues. When I got my hand right here, she said, I started speaking in tongues. Then I went like this to my kids, and they got right there and started speaking in tongues. Because when the Lord is moving, people want to be a part of it. We had four Mormon nuns come to our burn service last week. Why? Because they said, we've heard about this Holy Spirit guy in the Bible, and he's related to God and Jesus. We know that he's related. We've heard about that. But we want to experience it. They did. I don't know what they thought about it, but it was good. So church growth, I have a friend of mine in Colorado, took 30 young college-age students and grew a group from 30 to 300, I mean, three, I mean excuse me, 300 and grew it to 1,000 and the 1,500. Took 30 college students and grew it to 1,500. And I said, well, I said, how did you grow your group? He said, all you need in any church, in any ministry, is 10 people on fire for God and on fire for what you're doing and your church will double in one month. Poland, God just needs 10 people in here, 10 people in this church to get on fire for him and on fire for what God's doing in this church. You know what? Your pastor is young. He can preach two services. Why not three? Fill this church up. Why did you build a sanctuary so big? To fill it up with people, to keep filling it up. Every time you see an empty chair, you ought to take that personal. It's my responsibility to fill this chair next week. Go find crackhead Sally and bring her in next week. Yes, she may cause a disruption, but that'd be fine because the Holy Ghost will be on her, and she'll be good. You know, God doesn't need, I feel, another church or another business or anything to rise up right now. God needs one church in any city to be about his business. I mean, to be about his business, to see people change. I went into this one city recently. This is what I like to do. I like to, before I go preach somewhere, I go into a gas station. I always go into a gas station, and I say, hey, where's this church at? And I like to hear the response from the different people in the city. I've gone into some churches, to some cities, and they say, I've never even heard of that church. What's it called? 
the first assembly of God? They said, no, I've never heard of it. It's like two miles from the convenience store. I've gone into some cities, and they're like, well, that's the only church in our city because nobody else goes to the other one because they got it going on. I said, what do you mean they got it going on? They say the power of God is there. And I've gone into cities of five and 600 people that a church will run 350. More than 50 or 60% of the city goes because one pastor says, all I want is to see the power of God flow. I want the fullness of God. That is church growth right there. See, 15 times in the New Testament it says this, you know, those that have ear, let them hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. You know, and here's how church grows. You don't go to the pastors, what's the Lord saying? What's the Lord saying? What's the Lord saying? What's the, and you go ask the people, what's the Lord saying for the church? What's your responsibility for the church? Because we're one body, fitly formed together. If I'm thirsty and I want a drink of water, I can think about it all day long, but I've got to get my arm, my hand, and my mouth to all cooperate together for me to get some water. And that water is what's going to bring me life. You've got to, you've got to step up and do what God has called you to do. See, you can't just go to church. We are the church. And when you come to church, you've got to get ready to have church. You need to want to come and be excited. You know, see, revival will cost you a lot, but most people aren't willing to pay the price. One day I was sitting in prayer, and I felt the Lord say that, that everybody wants to taste the fruits of revival, but only few will do what's necessary to actually achieve it. And are you actually wanting to achieve it? See, Amos 3 and 12 says this, Thus says the Lord, As a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two eggs or a piece of ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. And this is what this means. If you're a shepherd and, and you're overseeing a hundred sheep for somebody else, if a lion comes to consume them and it takes one of the sheep, that comes out of your wages. But if you go to, to the owner of the sheep and say, sir, here's a leg, that means that the lion attacked him by the head, but you fought, for, you fought for that sheep and you have a leg and you give the leg and it doesn't come out of your wages. But then if a lion attacks the sheep from the back end and you, and you, and you try to pull the little poor lamb out and you have an ear, it means you fought for him. Are we fighting Poland First Assembly of God for the people in our community? If we stood before the Lord today, would you say, Lord, these are my coworkers right here that you gave me that job. This is my family. These are my friends. These are the people that I'm fighting for. Are you fighting for anybody? Or are you just trying to keep your head above water right now? See, there's a victorious life that we can live that you, pray, that you wake up in the morning and you don't come to prayer praying for yourself or just your family, but you're so on fire for God and have such a burden. See, Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36 to 38, it says Jesus was, was moved with compassion because he saw that there were people, sheep without a shepherd. Well, sometimes people don't come to church. You've got to be their shepherd. That's right. You've got to be a shepherd for so, so many people. Amen? So let me ask you this question. If I said, can you quote John 3.16, I think 81% of all Christian believing people should be able to quote that. But if I ask you to quote John, 1 John 3.16, this is what this says. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Now we are to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But you know, I think one of the biggest ways you can lay your life down for people is by fasting. In the fasting chapter in Isaiah 58, starting in verse 6, there's 23 things that constitute a true fast. Now, we're about to get into the good part. This is where it gets really good. When you fast, there's 23 things that's going to happen. And these are the first four. We're just going to talk about the first four. Hallelujah. The first one is to loose the bonds of wickedness. Think about this. If this church was have fast, we fast and pray, we're going to loose the bonds of wickedness. You know what that means? That people are going to walk in bound and things are going to be loose from them. They're going to choose if they want to be set free or not. We'll get to that point later. And the next thing is to undo heavy burdens. Have you seen somebody ever walk into church and then come to an altar and turn around and leave? You know why? Because God touches them. Why? Because there's people that have been fasting and praying. Will you fast for others? The next one is let the oppressed go free. Let the oppressed go free. Dear Jesus, have you heard the first three? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free. And now here's the fourth one. Are y'all ready? This is so good. I, I'm so excited. To break every yoke. Break every yoke. Now this is what the Word says. If we fast and pray for our region, this is what, and this, I'm, I'm going to go and tell you what I feel. In, what you're doing is not just for Poland, Arkansas. God gave me a word in February of 2011 that I preached like this with a broken foot that God is going to open up houses of revival all across America. Shortly after that, Dutch Sheets prophesied that there would be 500 houses of revival 
all over America that people would flock to. The word that God gave me in February 2011 was this, that there would be John the Baptist anointings upon churches and ministries. See, the thing is, it's just not a minister. Ministries. You're a ministry here at this church. You know what John the Baptist said? Hang on. I'm going out in the middle of the desert. And now I'm going to preach. And everybody over here is going to come over here where the fire is at. See, when people get cold enough, they're going to go where the fire is at. You know what I'm saying? And so this is what I feel over this church right here, that the God has given you an opportunity to have a regional anointing. All right, let me get back to where we were. Isaiah 58, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Do you know what the word every means in Hebrew? Every. Just, it means every yoke. It means all of them. To break everything. Some of you are looking at me like, man, hurry up. I'm ready for lunch. Good. But, the, but half of you are like, man, I'm ready for this. Do you really want to live out the books of the Bible, what it says in Acts, that you can come in and you can see people coming in five 10, 15, 30. Sometimes you can have more visitors in a service than regular people because you fasted and prayed fast. Does that mean like not eat? Yeah. One time I told my wife, I said, I felt the Lord said, fast sports center. Nobody stoned me. Fast sports center for a month. So I fasted sports center for a month. Six months later, my wife said, how long is your sports center fast? I'm like, oh yeah. I forgot I was even fasting it because I got so caught up with giving that hour to God. And my wife says, Joe, do you know how much better of a husband you are? Do you know sometimes you're afraid you miss something? We all know what's going to happen. The Dallas Cowboys are going to miss the playoffs by one game next year. We all know what's going to happen, you know. <laughs> hey, I used to have nine season tickets to the Cowboys. I love the Cowboys. God bless them. They let me down, though. So, but the thing about it is, when I gave up that hour, my wife said, you became such a better husband. You became such a better father that sometimes you didn't even want to watch Sports Center twice to make sure you didn't miss anything. There's so many things that you could give up that you thought that actually mattered. But you know what matters? Malachi, Judah, and Ezra. My three little kids, the, the, you know, the main people I'll ever train, raise up, and disciple are my three kids because they're going to be a, like an arrow shot into this nation. I remember one time, this is a cool story. When we have our burn revival meetings, sometimes I like to have three people speak, different three people speak. Well, I had a, a young guy that called and said, you know, I'm just going to back out. I just don't want to preach. So I told my wife, I said, baby, I had this, this young preacher back out because he just said he just didn't want to preach that night. He just, he knew if the power of God was going to fall and he didn't think he was ready. My nine-year-old Malachi, she's my little princess. She stood up and said, dad, I'll preach. I said, baby, there's going to be a lot of people there. I mean, are you sure? She said, I'm called to preach, aren't I? I said, you sure are. She said, okay, put me in. And I said, all right. So she walked up there, and here's the thing. She is meek, she is quiet, she is humble, and she's bashful. She stepped up behind the pulpit, and you couldn't see her, so I had to pull the pulpit back and put her up on a step. So she got up on a step, and she preached for four minutes. And, you know, the, the next day she said, Dad, do, do, you think I, do you think it made a difference? And I said, well, baby, let's pull up, let's pull up YouTube. Her first day, she had like 100 hits. You know why? Because people saw a nine-year-old little girl preach in front of about 150 people because she knew that she had a call of God. And she said, Dad, how come the older people wouldn't do it? I said, baby, because they don't understand they're called. She said, how could they not know they're called? I said, because maybe nobody told them they were. Because if they can't hear his voice, they have to have somebody else's voice speaking into their life. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to pull people from the outside in. And we've got to speak into their life and tell them you can do and you can be everything that God has called them to do. And I want to tell some people in here, when you were 5, 7, 8, 14 years old, you heard, you felt God speak to your heart in Sunday school that you were going to do something and you pushed it aside. That's a seed of purpose and destiny and it is in your life. And God is going to bring that out tonight. Amen. That's for the service for tonight. And this is what I know for this season. In 1 Samuel 10... The people of Israel were like, everybody else has a king. We want a king. We want a king, God. We want a king. So the Lord loved his people and said, I'll give you a king. So he gave them the best looking man in the kingdom, Saul. And what happened is when Samuel the prophet, Samuel was told to go anoint Saul, king of Israel. He got a flask of oil. A flask is a beautiful man-made device that carries oil. And he poured it over his head. First Samuel 16, what happened is God said, now it's time for me to bring my king forth. So he grabbed a young man named David to come in, 
and what happened is Samuel went back to anoint him again, but this time he didn't care a flask of oil, which was man-made. He cared a horn of oil, and the horn of oil is God-made, and he poured it over his champion. This is what I feel, that the churches in the last 10 or 15, 20 years has been trying to have revival, and we've tried everything we can. We've tried to grow the church in every way that we can, and you know what? It's really not working. Now it's time for God to say, now this is what I want to do. Leonard Ravenhill says, real revival is when man messes it up and God just steps down and does it himself. You know, and so this is what I feel, that this is God's hour for revival. God's about to do something big. And it's when men and women of God step back and say, Ephesians 3, 19 and 20, God, I want the fullness. And the churches will grow and the churches will be filled up for the people who are seeking the Lord. Amen. And this is, and this is what's going to happen. This is Acts 3. I'm going to tell this story real quick. I'm going to come down here and hang out with y'all for a minute. This, this is in Acts chapter 3. Peter and John, there's seven times in the Bible Peter and John were together and they did something. They were walking to church one day. They were just kind of walking to church. They were going to church, but they, well, they didn't have it done yet because the Bible hadn't been written, but they did Matthew 6 and 6. They'd already spent time with the Lord, right? They'd already spent time with the Lord. So they were the church, having church, going to church, not praying, oh God, please get me there so I can get filled up so I can make it another week. And so they were going to church and they were walking and all of a sudden in Acts chapter 3 and 13, they saw it and there was a man sitting right outside the church. Catch this. A man sitting right outside of the church that had never been to church. And, and, they, and he, he asked them for some money. And they said, silver and gold have I none. But they did a huge miracle at this time. They stopped. When is the last time you stopped for somebody? You stopped your life. They did another miracle. They gave him his attention. Now, how do you think that a homeless broken down person will feel if you stopped and gave them attention you just stopped and gave them your, your Saturday morning I remember I have a friend of mine he started a church called Church Under the Bridge and it's in a homeless community it's Church Under a Bridge it's a real cool name right he has Church Under a Bridge for homeless people and people just come and love on these homeless people so he walked up stopped started speaking to this person and then they did the craziest thing they reached down lifted him up now here's the man the Bible says that this man had been crippled since birth there are people that you're going to come in contact with that there's a certain time in their life they have been crippled. They could have been molested. They could have been beaten. Somebody could have verbally abused them. A coach could have said, you're not good enough to be on my team. So the rest of their life, they've never thought they were good enough to be on anybody's team. There's so many people in our society that is crippled. They stopped, they reached out to them, and they spoke life into them, and then they pulled him up on their level and could look at him eye, eye to eye. He'd been like that way for his whole life. Then they took him to church with them. Now, the thing is, everybody that had walked past him that morning, right outside the gate beautiful, which was right to the doors of the temple of the church, looked and said, you know, I've walked past you. And I never saw that you had a destiny, a purpose, and God's hand was on you just like it was on me. I'm sorry because I had my stilettos and my skirt and my new suit, and I walked right past you, and I judged you. I didn't bring you anything. I may, I may have gave you something. I may have gave you something physically and gave you four dollars and patted myself on the back and said, I just did a great deed, but you really didn't give them anything. You just enabled them to keep going in the lifestyle that they were living. Sometimes we like to enable people instead of lead people to Christ and get them healed. So this this person went in and revival started because they had saw somebody that they knew healed. How long did Peter and John spend with this gentleman? Five minutes? Seven minutes? You know where another revival was? That, per, that gentleman that got healed, his parents' house, because praise God, he just moved out of the house. So he got moved out of the house, and he because all these families were walking by going to church, and he was like, I want a wife. I want 2.2 kids in America. I want to do this, but there's one thing in my life that is holding me back, but nobody walking into the church cares enough about me to stop and tell me about this Jesus that they're driving right past me to go see. I want to see somebody who's got Christ living in them, and it's real in their life. Amen? Is that speaking to anybody? My neighbor, I got you. People say that. It's good. But it's time that we do that. Acts 4 and 13 now, they, they perceived the boldness of Peter and John, but they marveled. And they realized they were untrained and uneducated men, but they'd been with Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. Give people Jesus. Read the Word. Know the Word. Give them life. There are so many people in our society that are dying inside. But the reason sometimes that we don't minister is because we're just trying to make it. Sometimes you just got to get past yourself. 
You know, I don't even pray for myself personally that much. I pray for my wife and my kids. I pray for our, our, our burn ministry and our young adult ministry and our church, and then I move on and I go pray for others because I've been called. You know, think about the one selfish thing that Jesus did. You know what it was? Me neither. He didn't. He didn't do anything for himself. It was all about, hey, Jesus didn't really sleep. He got up early in the morning and went there. He prayed. He went to the woman of the well and prayed during the day. He sent the disciples away after he had been ministering, preaching, and praying for thousands. And he went up on the mountain to pray. Have you ever just walked up a mountain like that? Me neither. It took him a long time to walk up on the mountain and prayed. And then he had to walk down the mountain. And then it was daylight. Jesus always spent his life praying for others, praying for others, giving his life for others. How much do we honestly give away? How much do we give ourselves away for others? You know, when we become a Christian, the Bible says our life's not our own. We're supposed to be. It says in Luke 9, 23, it says that we pick up our cross and follow him daily. What does that mean? That we die to the flesh daily. We pick up our cross daily. A cross is a place of death. That each and every day that we, we, we die to ourselves. Amen. Okay, this is, this is right here is really good. This is in 2 Kings 4. This is talking about Elisha. I'm going to come in here one more time. i got two more stories, then we're going to close, and the Lord is going to do an amazing work. This is Elisha, the man of God, in 2 Kings 4. He went up to a widow woman, and she said, he said, what are you doing today? She said, well, I have two sons, and the creditors are coming. You know the story. Things are not good. We're really down and out. He says, what do you have? She said, well, I've got a, a, small, jar, a small jar of oil. That's all I've got in the house. He said, well, that's all you need. See, some of you... You just have a little bit of something in your life, you think, but that's all you need. You say, well, my, my spiritual walk is small. That's fine. It's about to grow. So this is what the man of God said. He said, I want you to go to all your neighbors, all your aunts and uncles and all your friends, people over there at Malvern and people all around, and I want you to go get every pot and vessel you can find that's empty. See, all she had, whoo, built-in props, come on Jesus. She had a little jar of oil about this size right here with these crazy folks they got some kind of faith see here's the thing we come to church and and we think the bible says that we walk by sight not by faith because we know what's going to happen right they're going to sing four songs we're going to do this no, no this is what we do we live by faith see i come to church thinking somebody's going to get saved up in here i come in here thinking somebody's get filled with the holy spirit I come in here thinking everybody's going to get healed because that's what it, it says in the Bible multiple times. I walk by faith and not by sight. We should come to church so excited about it because something's going to happen. So what happened is the man of God had this little jar of oil made in Jerusalem, and he had this little jar of oil, and he walked up to all these pots and vessels that were lined up, and he poured, oh, we're, we're about to stretch some people's imaginations and mindsets in here, okay? God is about to, I feel this in my spirit so strongly. He's about to stretch your mindset on what you think church is. He had this little jar of oil, and there's this huge vessel right here. And the first vessel's filled. The second vessel's filled because the man of God told them to go get every vessel, every empty vessel. Is there any empty vessels out there that you see each and every day, people that are hollow inside? So he filled them up, filled up the fourth one. The fifth one, the tenth one, the twenty-third one, the thirty-first one. Well, that one need a little more. And the thirty-fifth, forty-seventh, seventy-one, one hundred four, two eighteen. Can you believe that? This little thing right here is fuller than it was when I started, and we just filled up two hundred and eighteen empty vessels with it. And then all of a sudden, on the very last vessel, when when they poured the oil, and then he said, "Is the man of God? Is there any more vessels?" They said, "No." We have no more vessels. The Bible says that he said then the oil quit and ceased to be poured out. That's how the Holy Spirit is. As long as you go out into the highways and the byways and you bring the empty vessels into First Assembly of God, Poe Arkansas, God is going to pour out his spirit. You know, when I go to these churches and I go to some churches, they're dry. Whoo, southern draw, they dry. You know, and I'm, I'm talking like, man, when, you know, the first thing I ask them, when's the last time you had a prayer meeting? You don't? When's the last time you had a visitor come to this church? The oil quit being poured out. They quit expecting something to happen. When you come to church, sometimes at our church, people come to the front. They don't even sit down. They're just kind of like this. <sighs> Why? It's about to happen. 
It's about to happen. Something's going to happen. And you know, that's how we should be. Each and every one of us should come expecting and exciting. But here's what happens. In Matthew 26, 36, one day, Jesus is getting close. To Jesus is going to go to the cross. And Jesus, his heart was burdened. And he said, you know, I'm going to the Garden of Gethsemane and I need to pray. Jesus had his multitudes. There's tons of Christians out there. And then Jesus had his 70. There's a lot of people who are faithful to the church. And then Jesus had his 12. And then Jesus had his three. And Jesus said, right now I need my three. I need my three that I can count on the most. Come here. Come here, three. Now, let's, look, this is my time. I need you to pray with me for one hour, 60 minutes. It's not going to be that hard. I need you three to sit right here. I'm going to go in here and have a secret time with, with my father, but I need you to intercede for me. I need you three to be, be strong with me right now, okay? Just one hour, 60 minutes. You're my boys, my big three. So Jesus goes over and he starts praying, and he's coming back over there, and his three are sleeping. His three are sleeping. And he said, guys, I ask you to pray with me for one hour. They're like, oh, Jesus, we were going to, but I know you, I, we know you called us to teach Sunday school, but I'm tired. My flesh is tired. My spirit is willing. My flesh is weak. Okay, pray with me for one hour. We'll start, start our clock over. One hour. I'm going to go over here and pray for a minute. He started praying, and he came back. And he said, guys, what are y'all doing? I called you to do men's ministry. I, I called you to be a leader in the church. I called you to this church so the pastor could raise you up and launch you out into another church. I know. I know you called us, but, you know, we're just tired right now. We're just, we got too much of the flesh in us. You know, my kid's in ball. He made select team. He made all-star. He made American Legion. That's three extra practices. I mean, we just got so much going on. I know you've called me to all this stuff. I know we took four vacations this year. But my family deserves it. You know, and then all of a sudden, the third time, Jesus goes away and he comes back. And, and they're still sleeping. And we look at them and we say, how in the world could people be sleeping when Jesus calls us to do something? We do it every day. We do it every day. We do it every single day. Because, see, here's what happens. Habakkuk 2 and 2 says when you get a vision, write it down and make it plain. In the, in the New East Texas, Texarkana version, it says write it on a sticky note and put it on the mirror of your bathroom. Therefore, it can never leave. I've got stuff. My wife, we have a beautiful house God has blessed us with. My wife says, Joe, you got stuff in our bathroom. I know it's your side. Jack and Jill, but Joe, you've got stuff and lanyards just all over your mirror. And I said, baby, I am not going to forget the things that God has placed in my heart to be and the things that we're going to do. So Jesus needed his three people the most. Well, is there three men of God in here that you're not leading your house the way God has called you to? Is there three women in here that God has maybe told you to go get your education and become a school teacher? You know what a school teacher is? is a government-paid youth pastor. That's what a school teacher is, in my, my opinion. Do you know what a nurse is? A nurse is somebody that goes into a room where there seems to be no hope, and they're getting paid by the hospital to bring hope. You just kind of walk up to them. You know, they say, you can't pray for them. That's okay. Boom, got me a job. And then you walk out. That's what it is. There are so many people that are asleep. There are so many people sleeping and what God has called them to do. Okay? Right? You got it? But here's what happens. In the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, it says this 36 times. It's like we couldn't get it the first time, or the 10th, or the 20th, or the 35th. So it's in there 36 times. It said, and there was a sweet-smelling aroma unto the Lord. 36 times it says there's a sweet-smelling aroma unto the Lord. Do you know what that was all 36 times? Is when something that was living was sacrificed at an altar for God. Something that was living was sacrificed at an altar for God. 23 times in the New Testament, it says Jesus healed them all, or they were all healed. It says in Matthew 18 and 18, As surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And whatever you ask for in my Father's name, it will be done. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there in the midst. And then Matthew 12 and 13, this is where I close. This is so powerful right here. This is so powerful. If the band wants to come up. Now I hope this message is speaking to somebody today. This is what happens in, in Matthew 12 and 13. On the Sabbath, Jesus was in a synagogue. And there was a lot of people around and a lot of people was like this. Okay, now in tradition, you can't heal on the Sabbath. In our denomination, you can't do this. You, we can't sing this song. You just can't do what 
you wanting to do right now, Jesus, I know you're Jesus, the Son of God, but we don't do things like that. Have you ever had somebody that they were like, you can't do this, you can't speak in tongues here, you can't do what God has called you to do. Well, let me tell you what Jesus did. Jesus walked up in the synagogue and He was looking around at the people. Sometimes when you walk into a crowd of people, there is one person. There is one person. There is one person that you're there for. Jesus is looking around the synagogue and He sees one man. His hands like this. His hands withered. 99% of His physical body is fine. 99% of His physical body is fine. But there's one thing that's bothering Him. His hand is withered. Well, let's say back then they didn't have any computer tech jobs available. Let's say he was a farmer and he had a shovel. How can you shovel with a withered hand? You can't. We'll say he was a fisherman. They didn't use Zepco 33s back then. They threw nets. You can't throw a net with a withered hand. Well, let's say that he was called to be a carpenter. If you have a withered hand, you know what? You, you can't use a hammer. And Jesus saw this man and this man saw him. Everybody was telling this man, you can't do this and you can't do that because this is how it's always been done. There's some people told you that you may have a disease in your life and you're saying, well, most people, they only live so much longer because of that. There may be some people in here that you say, you know, your family's no good. You're not going to amount to anything. But did you me tell you how I got the name Jojo? When I was young, I stuttered so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't even say my name. I stuttered so bad. People would make fun of me sometimes because of, of my name. I couldn't speak in front of anybody. And one day the power of God touched me and the Lord put a burden in my heart to preach. And I said, God, I can do anything. So you know what that was? That was my withered area in my life. I had a slur and a speech impediment. I couldn't speak right. But you know what? God touched me. So Jesus looked at the man with the withered hand and he just looked at him and said, come. And the man with the withered hand started walking to Jesus. And this is so powerful. And now you're the man with the withered hand. Jesus walked up to him. And the man walked up to Jesus. And everybody around, everybody that said, you can't, 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 was silence. It was a kairos moment, which means a God-ordained moment. That this man with the withered hand walked up to Jesus. And Jesus said this, stretch forth your hand. Now, did he tell him to stretch forth his, his withered hand? Or did he tell him to stretch forth his good hand? He didn't. He just said this simply, stretch forth your hand. See, what happens is when we have an altar call, Pastor Sullivan does an altar call on Sundays, you come to the altar and somebody says, oh, brother, how can I pray for you? You stretch forth your good hand. Oh, I just need a financial miracle. But you didn't talk about your pornography addiction. Or you didn't talk about how you yelled at your wife. The man looked at him and he stretched forth the one withered area of his life and the Lord touched him. And the Bible said this, that his withered hand was made whole just like the other hand. And he was made completely whole. Then he was able to step into everything that God had for him. And he was able to be a productive part of society. There's some people here that you've got some things inside of you that's withered that nobody may even know about. But you can allow the power of God to touch you today. And you can be made whole physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. And you can be what God has called you to be. And you can walk in the Ephesians 3 and 19 and 20 life and have the fullness of God. And some people say, well, you don't know my situation, but I know what the Bible says, that the Lord will take your hand and walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. It didn't say He was going to leave you camped out there. He's going to walk you through each and everything. Before we get to that, is there anybody in here that is not 100% sure that if you died right now that you would make heaven? You're not 100% sure. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Got one? Would you mind coming up here, young man? I want you to see Pastor Sullivan right now. Hey, everybody give him a hand. Now, for everybody else that didn't, that means that you already know the Lord, which is great because that means you know the sound of your Father's voice. So here's what we're going to do. I want everybody in here to say, Lord, what is the number one withered area in my life? The one thing that is holding me back from the gifts and the callings that I have. And as we're doing this, I feel the Lord saying that there's some destinies and purposes that He's called to some people in here tonight that you have suppressed that. 
And there is a seed of destiny in some people in this place tonight that is laying dormant. It is laying dormant in your lives, and God is going to bring it to life. And it is being covered up by a withered area. I want you to ask the Lord, God, what is the number one thing holding me back? What is my withered area in my life? Is it shame? Is it guilt? Is it past failures? Is it it's never been done before? To every withered area in every person's life, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, the lie that people believed about those withered areas, we say right now, God, that you speak to those areas and tell them how you really feel about them in those areas of their life, Lord. We rebuke, erase, and dissolve all lies that we believed about ourselves in the name of Jesus. I'm going to ask anybody and everybody that is willing, as we're all, as it's all stand, we're going to go back into worship for a song, but anybody and everybody that is willing to, I'm going to ask you to come line up along this front and, and the pastoral staff and the leaders of this church. We are going to anoint you with oil. And we are going to believe that those withered areas of your life are made well and that you will be changed, that you will be set free, and that Jesus Christ is going to touch him. If you feel comfortable, go to the altar, line up along the front, and we're going to believe that just like Jesus did, that man stretched forth that withered area. And the Bible says that area was made well as well as the other one. That there comes a time that you're going to walk in the purpose that God has for you that you are going to go home and you're going to tell people what God did in your life today. This church is going to be filled tonight with people that are coming in to be changed because there is a power of God that is here today. You know, 23 times in the New Testament, it says Jesus healed them all or they were all healed. We're believing for a complete power and restoration upon people's lives today. It says it in Leviticus 
It says that the jobs of the ministers is that they should always keep the fire on the altar burning. But you know what it says in Hebrews that we are all ministers. It's what I'm going to ask everybody to do if you would. It, this is what the Lord asked in Leviticus to the ministers, that the minister was always keep, keep wood on the altars. You know what wood is? It's something that, that's been cut. It's been something that's cut off, and it's something that's dead. And as long as you keep putting dead things upon the altar, the fire of God will burn. And in that passage I'm talking about in Leviticus, it says the fire on the altar should never go out. There's some people in here that the, I feel that the, the Lord's telling me that your fire has gone out, but there's dead things in your life that you need to come put at an altar. See, the one thing that will keep you back is pride, which is the number one thing. That's the reason that Satan got kicked out of heaven was pride. Hey, guys, we're a church family. Church families do not judge. They just applaud one another. A true family is there for one another, believes in one another, picks up one another. I just wish these altars could be just flooded with people that says, you know, I just want to put something down. One thing for me personally, I answer every altar call just about because I always, want, the Bible says that the wood and the fire should be perpetually burning. It should never go out constantly. You know, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He got under the, the a city and just cried out to God and repented for everything he could think about because he wanted to walk in the fullness of God. And this is what it is in Leviticus, that the ministers would come and place stuff on, on the altar and constantly put wood on the altar, put the sacrifice. You know what they would burn? The fatted offering. What is fat? It's something that we don't want. It's something that is sacrificed. Why do you go to the gym? You know, you know because they put the, the sacrifice. Come put things upon the altar and allow God to burn away things that are not of Him tonight. Because husbands, there is a you that your wife and your kids are depending on that you will do your business with God. Wives, your husbands and kids are depending on you to be the woman of God. There are some, some people that, that the reason God gave you a job is to be the person of God that He has called you to be. And God does business at an altar. When you get married, where do you get married? At an altar. Because that's when you're making a declaration before people. This is the time I wish that these altars would be flooded with people would say, God, is there any, any way in me that you want? Because I just want to give it up. I feel that the Lord's saying that there's some people that need to just have a complete restoration in your life. The Bible in Acts talks about a refreshing that a refreshing time is coming. So if there's anybody in here that you want to be completely restored in God today, that you just say, God, I may have draw, been drawn a little cold, or I just need a, a new, fresh touch from you, I'm going to ask you to come join us at the altars, line up along the front, because there is a time of refreshing coming. Beautiful love, you are my king, and you are the one, my everything. Now I run to you, cause you are all I need. Oh. You know, the song they're saying is uh, our life is not our own. The Bible says that, that when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that rivers of living water will come out of us. You know what rivers is? It's not one river. Rivers is plural. And if you don't have just constantly rivers just flowing out of your life, you just need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. You need restoration. You know, whenever the, 
There's so many times in the Old Testament that the fire of God would fall and consume a sacrifice or it would fall from heaven. After it would fall, the way God intended is that we would keep the fire burning from glory to glory to glory to glory. But when Israel, it seemed God's chosen people and we're God's chosen people, would let the fire burn down, there would be a fresh fire. And I think there's some people in here that you need a fresh fire in your life today. You need a fresh touch for the power to come upon you. Because those rivers that are, are, are supposed to be flowing, they've been clogged up. Well, the Holy Spirit wants to unclog some things today and some people. And I just feel that if you would allow God to touch you today, remember that first time that you got saved? Remember that first time you, you got touched by the Holy Spirit? And you just, just felt God just touch you? You haven't felt that way in a while. I invite you to come join us at the altars. I feel a resistance, and it's okay. Just, just come on. Just come on anyway. Just trust me. You don't know me. Just trust me. And allow the Lord to touch you afresh today. And set up. I'm going to ask you to line up along this front right here. And allow God to do what He wants to do in your life today. Completely, our life is not our own. Here we are, God. Some of y'all wouldn't, wouldn't come if I offered you 100 bucks. I don't have 100 bucks. But if I did, I'd give it to you. Anybody wants a fresh touch from God today, line up along the front.
struggle with is called illegitimacy and and the word father is not a good word to a lot of people if there's some people that's been hurt by an earthly father and understand the bible says that there's none perfect no not one so you could have the greatest father in the world and there was some part in their life that they weren't everything that you needed and that's where god comes in and even the bible says that god will be a father and mother to the fatherless and he'll be everything that you need So we talk about how God the Father can do this and do that and bring the fullness of God the Father into your life. Some people hold back and they say, well, 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 my father, I've been hurt by my father, so I'm not going to completely give myself away because we don't understand that. Because we don't understand the love of God and how much that he loves us and how much he believes in us. I mean, think about this. He gave his only begotten son. But think this. God sent Jesus as his only son, took him back as his oldest son, and we became the manifested sons and daughters of Christ. That's where the Bible says before the foundation of the world that we were adopted into the kingdom. We, and the Bible says that we're supposed to, Jesus said we would do greater things than he would do. We are the church body. We're an adopted child of God brought into the kingdom. So what happens is this, is that our, we're supposed to do greater signs, wonders, and miracles than Jesus Christ did. But when we as a church body walk in the fullness of God, we're going to receive that. So right where you're at, I just want to say, God, if there's any person in this place that is dealing with illegitimacy, their father may have done something. They may have had a coach that said they weren't good enough. There may be some young girls that your father never danced with you when you were a little kid. He never called you princess. He may have never told you you were beautiful. Therefore, you've settled your whole life and not thought that you were beautiful. But let me tell you today, there is a Father in heaven that the Bible says look down from the balcony of heaven and says, you are the apple of my eye. And women of God, I don't care if you're 88 years old, you are the princess of God. He loves you and has an everlasting love for you. And you are beautiful. And He has a breathtaking purpose for every person in here. Guys in here, there is a Father in heaven that looks at you and says, that's my boy right there. You are man enough to do what I've called you to do. You are man enough to lead your house. You are man enough to be a good father. You are man enough to be a good husband. And and, and men, some of our wives God has given us is the most perfect gift. And we don't even understand it. We mistreat the gift of God. That's how we also mistreat the gift of God of the Holy Spirit sometimes and don't use the Holy Spirit. I just feel that the Lord said right now that He wants to deliver some people from illegitimacy completely deliver them so this is what I would kind of like you to do this is for everybody if you're willing to do this if you have a, a, a wound against your father or your mother I want you to say you can call him by name let's say his name's Bill I want you to say God I forgive Bill I release Bill and I pray that you bless Bill and also this goes I feel the Lord saying for unforgiveness if there is somebody that they did something to you and you keep reliving it in your mind that you're mad at them, I'll say their name is Mary. Say, God, I want, I want to forgive Mary. I, I forgive her, I release her, and I bless her. You've got to let some things go today. You've got to let some things go and let God heal you. For People that will not forgive, unforgiveness is holding so many people back. And Lord, I pray that you heal my friends from illegitimacy today. So they can be healed. So they can impact the world. And Father God, we pray this so they can look at you and hold their heads up high. See, there's so many people in here that you can't hold your heads up high because you 
can't really imagine and fathom that you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Well, let me put it to you like this. He gave His only Son for you. Would you give your your first, Would you give your child for somebody else? No, me neither. I don't love y'all that much. But God does. That He gave His only child for you. And when you realize that, you can walk in the fullness of God, knowing who you are and knowing whose you are. It's hard to hit a target when you don't know what you're aiming at. The Lord came to do some business in some people's lives today. I feel that some of the pillars in this church aren't doing anything. They're sitting on a pew. But God says, after this day, when He touches you, when you allow Him, see what happens is we get the Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, take us down the corridors of our life, the corridors of our heart, the places that we've shut everybody out from, everybody out from, because if somebody goes to that place, it hurts. There is something that is hurting. God wants all of you. See, some people, you're holding certain things back from the Lord. And today, God says, give it to me. And there's a reward on the other side. And that is the fullness. God wants to bring so much joy and so much peace to some people's lives tonight. Oh, Holy Father. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing. We're just going to go back into how he loves them. If everybody that is still here... If you just kind of close your eyes where you're at, don't pray, don't think, just let the Lord minister to you through this song. God, we thank you for loving us with a never-ending love.
the grace in his eyes if his grace is an ocean we're all seeking and the heaven meets earth i can unforeseen cares of my heart turns bound to the side of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, he loves us. Yeah. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good and so mighty and so awesome. Lord, I just love you and I thank you for being so good to us. God, I thank you. And Father, we welcome the outpouring of your Holy Spirit here. Come on, somebody agree with me on that. Don't let me be alone. Father, you're welcome in us. You're welcome in this house. You're welcome in our church. You're welcome in our community. The Holy Spirit, you pour yourself out and do whatever it is that you want to do. Your kingdom come and your will done, Lord Jesus, right here. Right here. Right here. And Father, we just thank you for this day. And Lord, as we leave here just for a moment, Lord, be speaking to us, be dealing with us, be moving on us, Lord God. The importance of coming back because your work's not done. It's not finished. There's still something more that you want to do tonight. God, prepare us now. Let us enjoy what we have, what we've experienced, what we've seen. But Father God, I pray, prepare us now for what you have tonight. Because there's a deeper work you want to do. And Father God, I'm going to say thank you right now. Thank you for the results we've had. Thank you for the results we're going to have. Thank you, Lord God, that you are doing what it is that you want to do. And Father, we just give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Somebody love the Lord. Said a good amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Would you do it? Hallelujah. Please be back with us tonight, 5 o'clock for service. There is a bridal shower this afternoon. What time? Is that 2 or 3? We have a bridal shower this afternoon for uh, Hensley Bates. Uh, be over here, I believe, in the fellowship hall. So y'all come and enjoy that. Uh, to our staff, no staff meeting today. We're going to go ahead and cancel that. We're just going to find another time to get together. We love you. God bless you. Shake hands, hug necks, because you love one another. We'll see y'all this afternoon. Bridal shower, 5 o'clock for service. God bless you.